lovies, these are the solutions for the check for understanding, lesson 85. Uh, before I ended the video um, on lesson 85, I said that for most of your responses on the ones I left you to do, you could probably use this post-it note as your um, guide to help you move through the problems. So I went through my answers to see if that was possible and I'll show you where things align as we move through the solutions. So I actually filmed this lesson video. I tried to film it once and then realized that my solutions didn't um, really line up with the post-it. So I actually did these solutions and then filmed the lesson and when I came back to go over these with you, I realized that my answers could be better. So in this case, I left the answer that I had and I'll show you a response that I think would be better. For the baseball tickets, it says explain, let me, let me just verify, give a reason why this survey might yield a biased result and explain the likely direction of the bias. So I'm just gonna do those two things. Um, give a reason and explain the bias. So my reason is that people in the most expensive seating will not be represented, so that's under coverage. And uh, sampling only the lower price ticket holders will likely result in an estimate that is too small because fans in the club seats and box seats probably spend more money at the game than fans in cheaper seats. So I address the two things, give a re reason and explain the direction of the bias. So the direction of the bias would be that our estimate is too small. Now, after I read through that in the solutions video, I realized that if I would have followed this post-it, I would have had a much better response. So this response follows the post-it. This sample does not re represent the population because there is under coverage of the most expensive seating. Sampling only the lower price tickets will likely lead to an underestimate of the actual amount of money spent that day because fans in the club seats and box seats probably spend more money at the game than fans in the cheaper seats. So what I have written on this post-it is an A plus response. This would be sufficient because I addressed the two things, give a reason, explain the direction. But this is a more well-rounded answer that you could um, use for any one of these responses. So it is well-rounded because it addresses the, these things on the post-it note. And most of these, like I said, can follow what I have on this post-it note. K4 wants to know the rate of non-response at the beginning. So I figured out how many did not respond. And then I made a proportion or calculated a proportion 89% of people did not respond or did not answer. So explain how non-response can lead to bias in this survey. Be sure to give the direction of the bias. So on this one, I do not address that this sample does not represent the population. I explain specifically how non-response can lead to bias. So the reason why non-response can lead to bias is because often the people who respond are different than the people who don't respond. So that's what I'm saying instead of this sample does not represent the population. Non-response can lead to bias in this survey if the people who answered the phone differ in a significant way from the people who did not answer the phone. Be sure to give direction of the bias. So I would say people who commute long distances may be underrepresented because they were not home to answer the phone. This will lead to an underestimate of the actual distance people drive on average per day. So my original response to this did not include over or underestimate of the actual value. And it's really important that we include that. So we're thinking these people can't answer the phone because they're commuting, they're driving to and fro. So that would lead to an underestimate of commuting distance. Uh, the next one is on response bias. So a practical problem with this survey is people may not give truthful answers. What is the direction of the bias? So the only thing they're asking us to address here is what is the direction of the bias? 
So I think the direction of the bias is that it's an underestimate of the actual proportion of people who ran at least one red light. But then you have to explain why. So I would not expect, expect people to claim they ran a red light if they didn't. Why would you do that? It's illegal. Conversely, I would expect you to lie if you did because it is illegal. Why would you admit to doing it? So either way, there's no advantage to you saying you ran a red light, whether you truly did or you didn't. So the most likely thing will be is that you're lying if you actually ran the red light, which means that this is an underestimate of the actual proportion of people who ran at least one red light. It would not be that this is an overestimate. People are not going to lie about running a red light if they didn't really run one. Seatbelt use, number five is where um, people were observed driving into the convenience store and uh, checked or recorded if they were wear wearing their seatbelt and then those same people were asked if they wear their seatbelt all the time. Do you expect bias in the same, so one, sorry, explain the reason for the bias and two, do you expect bias in the same direction? I am not saying this sample does not represent the population. I am explaining the reason for the bias. So the sample taken suffers from response bias. Why? Because this is a sensitive topic. So drivers are likely to lie about their seatbelt use because they feel embarrassed or ashamed to admit that they don't wear their seatbelt all the time. In most states, drivers are required by law to wear their seatbelt. I need to add that in. So they likely, or so, sorry, so they might lie, I lost my place, sorry, because they don't want to admit to doing something illegal. I believe most surveys about seatbelt use will suffer from response bias and overestimate the actual proportion of people who always use seatbelts. So would I expect bias in the same direction in most surveys about seatbelt use? Yes. For sure. And then last question is like um, the example on page 822, example one. So I have uh, highlighted what indicated to me the answer and then tried to explain. And I, I'm not giving a big written response. So comment on each of the following as a potential sample survey question. Is it clear or is it slanted? So you can see, I think A is slanted toward the warning label. B is slanted toward agreeing. C is not clear at all. D, question wording and slanted toward opinion two, because they're using very emotionally charged words like they're using a very negative word for saying the government can, should confiscate our guns. That seems very negative. And then they're saying, or we have the right to bear arms. Well, like who's going to want to vote to give up any of their rights? So this is question wording and slanted toward opinion two. And then E is slanted toward agree because they use the phrases should be favored, that this process is much needed, and then they're like trying to scare us and tell us like, if we don't do this, the possibility of nuclear war could be higher. Okay, as usual, if there, um, if anything is unclear or you have questions, email me or ask me the next time you see me in class. Okay, I love you guys.